We're with Ari Mizell, who wrote an outstanding book, different than most time management books, called so. Less Doing, More Living, which is exactly what all of us want to do. Uh, and what I loved is you gave absolutely specific tools and technologies that we can use that weren't available even five years ago oh, yeah. to make this stuff happen. So I don't know how we summarize a two-hour presentation in <laughs> a couple minutes, but first of all, give us the approach. How, how do we need to think differently first about this time management thing? Sure. So it, I really try to follow this framework that I've come to love, which is to optimize, then automate, then outsource. And okay. it's so important because I talk a lot about outsourcing and virtual assistants and all sorts of things, but the truth is, is that if you outsource an inefficient task, it mm -hmm. does not become more efficient. It just doesn't magically work that way. You have to optimize first, and that means taking a hard look on how you're doing things, what you're doing with your time, what are the processes that you're going through on a regular basis, and all of us go through processes on a daily basis that we just do on autopilot. So if you stop yourself and say, hey, wait a minute, what are the steps I'm actually going through to do this? How am I spending these hours of the day? That's the biggest and most important step. The second part is to automate, which is really with software or people sometimes, but it's that set it and forget it vein where you can create a system that just works and you don't have to worry about it again. If there's anything left over at that point, and a lot of times there isn't, that's when you look at outsourcing. So that framework applies to productivity, to teamwork issues, to health. You really can apply that framework. So uh, go to one piece of technology that I was in, in intrigued by that allowed you to automate like a nine-step task that yeah. required either an assistant or somebody else to do and and we don't really want to have any humans do things that we can now put on autopilot right so you what know, was this technology so zapier is i think what you're referring to yes. and ifttt which are two very similar websites but so iftt ttt if I this, then that. Oh, if then that's that. Yeah. I F T T T, and what was the other one? Zapier. Z A P I E R. So right. they're very similar. Uh, Zapier is more robust, and it's a paid service. It works with more applications, and it, it lets you do a little more fine tuning. But you know, give me an example. Right. So I mean, it. anything from as basic as if I put something on Twitter, then also put it on LinkedIn. That's something that even if it takes you a couple minutes, it's something that you can completely automate, which is a good thing. But of course. You can go way beyond that. So if somebody is a new project in Salesforce, then they get added to your project management program, which might be Trello or Asana, and that creates a new project, which is then assigned to a particular person, and then they start working on something. Uh, if you put a file into a Dropbox folder, somebody gets a notification that they have to start working on it, or that file then automatically gets converted and shared with your accountant. Maybe you're putting bills out that way. So it's these things that, you know, every time you do it, maybe it takes a minute or two, but that adds up throughout the day. And the example that I had given was that company HitReach that automated a 14-step process that used to take somebody 45 minutes. And now, not only doesn't it involve any possibility of human error, but that makes them scalable. They can do this 100 times a minute if they have to, if that's what the demand requires. Now, on the, on the flip side, we're become obsessed around these issues of exercise and sleep. Talk first of all about sleep, what we've learned about that recently. Right, so sleep is obviously important, we all know that, but it really is about quality versus quantity. You can get less hours of sleep if you're getting better sleep and still be very, very functional and happy and get all the things done that you need to get done. Part of it has to do with timing, as I mentioned, but the, the number one sort of biohack for this is to avoid blue light. It's, it's a really funny thing, but yeah. you know, before there was artificial lighting, we went to sleep when the sun went down, basically, yes. or shortly thereafter. So all the things that we're around at night and during the day, computer screens, iPhones, Kindles, TVs, LED lights, all these things have blue light spectrum, which tells our body that it's daytime and you should be awake. So rather than telling people that they should just shut off all that stuff before they go to bed and that's when they tune out from what I'm talking about, I, I recommend that people get these blue blocking sunglasses and you can get them for $8 on Amazon that you wear before you go to bed. It's an amber colored lens and you can read on your Kindle, you can play a game on your iPhone if you want and even watch TV and you won't be getting that blue light. And the first time you try it, you'll get better sleep that night. Outstanding. And I'd also heard that throw your alarm away in the morning, if there's a time you ought to set an alarm, it's at night. When to go to bed? Why? What's so, the rationale? There is this thing with sleep timing where we all have these cycles where we go from light sleep to deep sleep and REM sleep and back up many times in the night. And anybody who's had that experience where they, they felt like they got you know eight hours of sleep, but they got yeah. adequate sleep, 
but they wake up feeling kind of groggy, yeah. it's probably because their alarm woke them up in the middle of a deeper sleep cycle, and it's very hard to come out of that. You want to wake up at your, your lightest sleep moment. So you can actually work backwards in those sleep cycles, which for most people averages 90 minutes. Yeah. And if you want to wake up at 6 in the morning, five cycles before that takes you to 10.30 at night. And Plus 15 minutes to go to sleep, 14. you mentioned. 14. The average right. it takes someone to fall asleep is 14 minutes, so right. that would be 10.16. Yeah. And maybe that sounds a little geeky, but what's interesting about that is not only does that give you a better time to go to sleep yeah. in order to wake up at your lightest sleep point, but it also means that if you miss that window, don't kick yourself, don't go to sleep at 11 o'clock, wait until that next hour and a half rolls around and get something else done, read or do something else and then go to sleep, and even though you'll have slept less hours, you'll have gotten better quality sleep and you'll feel better. And then let's talk about last year, fitness. Mm -hmm. um, and folks feeling like they've got to get in hours and hours and hours. You're mm -hmm. looking great and an hour a week of yes. fitness. What's some of the new ideas around that that would be helpful to all of us? So there's, there's two sides of it, is really the hard charging intensity and then the recovery. Most people don't do enough of either. Mm. You know, droning along on the treadmill for an hour is not a good workout. It doesn't produce the hormonal stress response that you want to make your body get stronger. Intensity is where it hurts. You're breathing hard. You're on the floor. You don't like it. Yeah. And it's good to be uncomfortable every now and then, you know. So there is interval training where you're going for maximal effort with brief periods of rest in between. And the, the best known one is the Tabata interval, which is just four minutes. 20 seconds of maximal effort, 10 seconds of rest eight times through, and you're done. And it produces that hormonal response, it produces the, the cardio benefits, the metabolic responses that you want. And then the mobility stuff is on the flip side, the recovery. Most people don't take care of their joints, they don't take care of their, their nervous system, they're just hard charging all the time. Or they're just sort of droning along even at that medium pace, but they don't give their, side, their bodies the chance to recover. And recovery is I would argue more important than the exercise itself mm. because that's where you get stronger. That's where your body learns to do it better next time. So that's foam rolling, getting a massage, uh, getting into a sauna, cold therapy, all that kind of stuff where you're really taking care of your joints, your muscles, and your nervous system. Now, that was sleep and exercise. Nutrition's a big topic for you. And Absolutely. you mentioned, it, you know, we could talk hours on that, but you mentioned specifically importance of fats and three supplements, though, there's a lot of others that right. we need to be specific about for each individual, but there's three that you recommend, so. Yes, yeah. so on the supplement side, there are three that I recommend generally, and, and again, as I said, you know, you can get into a thousand supplements for whatever ails you, but the three that I like to recommend in general are vitamin D, because most people are deficient in vitamin D because they don't have enough good fats in their diet and they're inside and artificial lighting and wearing clothes. The other one is probiotics because we live in a very clean society where most of the American diet doesn't naturally consist of fermented foods. Right. And then the last thing is krill oil. Well, go back on why is that important though, the probiotics? Oh, sure. So, well, it goes in hand in hand with the probiotics. So we live in this clean environment, so we need to have bacteria in our bodies that are beneficial bacteria. Yes. And, you know, we're, everyone washes their hands with antibacterial soap. We avoid dirty situations. We don't eat those fermented foods like kimchi or sauerkraut even, which is pretty mild. And, and we're so, taking lots of antibiotics, which are going in. And our meat's got antibiotics in it. It's just killing all and of it that. it just keeps going. And it, it's destroying our biome, our gut biome, which is responsible for inflammation, for anxiety and depression, for all yeah. sorts of illnesses. So fermented foods would be great, but in the absence of that, taking a probiotic can help you really restore that balance. And the last thing is krill oil. So most people are familiar with fish oils or things like that, but yeah. krill oil is just more bang for your buck. You get more bioavailability from the compounds in krill oil. It specifically helps to lower C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker that you see in Crohn's and all sorts of inflammatory conditions. It will help lower that inflammation. It even helps with managing blood sugar. It's, it's just an amazing substance. And then for all that to work, we need more fat. And yes. you're at the lowest body fat you've ever had. And, yeah. and it's not so much a type of diet, it's that this is something we need to make our vitamins work. Exactly. You know, I struggled with this for a long time when I was making those recommendations for people because I never wanted to recommend paleo or Atkins yeah, or right. I never wanted to recommend a diet with a name. Yes. So for me, it's really about increasing the good fats and lowering the sugar, basically. Yeah. So you're lowering the inflammation and you're increasing the things that give you mind nourishing ketones and anti-inflammatory ketones again, and all of these properties that you need to then even absorb those vitamins like A, D, E, and K, which are all fat-soluble vitamins. 
the standard American diet has been has demonized fats, and yeah. we don't have olive oil and butter and uh, grass-fed beef and wild-caught salmon and all those things in our diet that we really should yeah. in order to fuel a better life. Good. All right. Hundreds of more specific, practical ideas like that in your book. I just encourage everyone to get it. Less doing and more living, which is what we want. So thank you so much for being here at the Fortune Leadership Summit. Thank you for having me. You bet.